Ryan. Well, if you're new here, we're studying the book of Colossians, going verse by verse through that book. We've come to the end of chapter 3. There's only four chapters, and we'll look at one verse in chapter 4 that goes with it. I've titled this kind of a series, um, The Heavenly-Minded Family. And we saw when we opened chapter 3 that Paul said we need to set our minds on heaven, not on earthly things. And basically what that means is we are to focus everything in life on doing the will of God. Okay? That's all that means. In your marriage, you want to do the will of God. As a wife, you want to do the will of God. As a husband, as a parent. And that's what we've been talking about in this series um, here's a heavenly-minded verse, Matthew 6, 33, famous thing Jesus said. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus was talking about them worrying about what they're going to wear, worrying about what they're going to eat, basically worried about their own selfish Wants. And he is telling them that if you put God first, if your mind is on God first, on heavenly things, that God is going to take care of you. He's going to provide for your physical needs, but more important, he's going to be, he's going to provide for your spiritual needs. Because this verse does not mean that you're going to be rich. It does not mean that you're never going to be sick, that you're never going to experience pain. This verse is not saying it's going to remove your wrinkles and whiten your teeth. But it's saying if you put God first and you're heavenly minded, God will take care of your needs, especially the spiritual, meaning he'll give you fulfillment in your soul. He'll give you wisdom to get through this life. Jesus said, hey, man does not live on bread alone because that's what we're all worried about. What, what are we going to have for lunch today? We don't live on, Jesus said, we don't live by bread alone, but by on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, we need the word of God more than we need physical bread. And so that's where we're at. So we saw the heavenly-minded wife, husband, the child, the parent, and now... We're going to look at the worker. Let's read Colossians 3, starting in 22, down to 4, verse 1. It says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, I would bet that most of you, if you are working at a job, there is something that you're unhappy about. I would, I would bet that many of you are in a very hard situation, and you don't even want to be there, but you have to be there. A uh, couple of bumper stickers I saw. I wish I had a job so I could quit, was one of them. One said this, on my way to work, please kill me. <clears throat> and I'm sure some of you can relate to that. And uh, I know some of you are you're going to be thinking as I'm preaching on this again, oh, you're a pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through at my work. And you got to remember, I haven't always been a pastor. And I used to be one of the unbelievers at the workplace cussing at everybody. And then when I became a Christian and quit cussing, everybody was cussing at me. 
So I've been there. I've been there. I found an old sermon this week that I did on this subject. I wrote it all out in pencil, but the title of the sermon was, Is It a Sin to Punch Your Boss? (laughs) So trust me, I can relate, and I think you can relate to what I'm talking about. I want to tell you why work is so hard. Remember when we started talking about marriage and I told you why marriage is so hard? Why? Because we went back to Genesis and we saw there was a curse on marriage. That's why marriage is so hard. And we talked about how Jesus Christ can reverse that curse that's on your marriage. Well, if we went back to Genesis, guess what we'd find? There is also a curse on work. And God clearly told Adam, now that you've disobeyed, he basically told Adam, now you're going to work and there is going to be pain. No longer are you going to enjoy work like you did before. It is going to be painful. It is going to be hard. And there's going to be suffering involved in it. And here's the worst part about work being cursed. You got people at your work who are cursed. And cursing, right? And so it's not only hard, sometimes it is impossible. But here's the good news of the gospel message today. Jesus can reverse the curse at your work. And what it will be is God will do a work in you, and you will be changed. You will be different, and that curse won't affect you anymore. And you'll be able to go and work with joy, serving God, not men. So, Paul, we're going to look, I'm going to break this down in two sections. We'll look at the heavenly-minded employee and then the heavenly-minded employer. And three sub-points I want to look at. Uh, First off, so number one, the heavenly-minded employee And first, I want to talk about slavery. I think it's important, but let's read the first part of 22 again. It says, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. That Greek word, doulos, I like the ESV's translation of bond servants. Paul would often say he's a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Um, but this word bond servant can just mean servants at a job. It's also translated slave. So many of your Bibles translate this, slaves obey your masters in everything. And what happens is, and you're going to run into this, skeptics who don't believe the Bible and don't read the Bible in context are going to try to tell you that the Bible condones slavery. And so instead of Paul saying, you know, slaves, obey your masters and everything, why doesn't just Paul come out and say, slavery is wrong? And so this is a good question. Well, first of all, when we read about slavery in the Old Testament and even slavery in the New Testament, in the Roman Empire that that Paul is addressing here, there was a lot of bad things going on with it. But in our modern day, see, when we hear that word slavery, we think about about people going to Africa and kidnapping people who were created in the image of God, putting chains on them and bringing them over here and torturing them to serve their masters. This is not talking about that. This isn't that kind of slavery. And I want to I show you what God thinks of that type of slavery. Let me read Exodus 21, 16. It says, Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. So if you want to know what God thinks about that type of slavery that happened in early America, God says those type of people that kidnap people and sold them to slavery, they should be put to death. And, 
And the, the God that said that in the Old Testament is the same today. And as we're going to see in this text, people are going to give an account for that. No one is going to get away with any of that that was done, I promise you. But the slavery here really, well, it was a matter of survival. If, if you wanted to feed your family, if you had no place to live, you would sign a contract and you would become a bond servant for a, a master. And so it was like signing a contract. So in modern day, it be, it's like you sign a contract and you work for a company. You now belong to that company. And so you have to be a servant for the company. But yet this was ancient times, so it was very different in our world today. But it definitely, the Bible always applies for today. This ancient book, it's so real uh, for today. Um, Paul would never condone any of the bad things going on in slavery. But what, what, what God always does in these situations, he tries, you know, Jeremy prayed, he prayed, change us from the inside out. That's what God does. He's got to change your heart first before it changes the outside of you. And so when Paul and God was dealing with slavery, he was trying to change human hearts, and then it would change the slavery around them. And Christianity absolutely changed the slavery that was going on in the Roman world. And what Paul is saying is, here's the way, here's the way you can defeat a, 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 a master that's treating you harshly, that's not treating you right, a boss. The way you defeat it is you change yourself on the inside and you realize you're free. You are free. I, I have met with prisoners and they have given their life to Christ and I, said, I would say to them, brother, you're free. Some of these, some of these, uh, these guys that are abusing you, they're not free. But even though you're in prison, you're free on the inside. Live as a free man. Serve God in here with all of your heart. And God will watch over you. God will protect you. So what Paul is saying is he's showing us the, the way to freedom. And freedom is in here. And don't let anybody try to steal that freedom or take it away. When you're, you're shackled to your frustration when you need to work for God, not for the boss, okay? Um, in the, there's a small book of Philemon right before the book of Hebrews. And Paul wrote a, just one chapter letter to Philemon. And it's very interesting. Philemon was a master. He was a slave owner. He seemed to have a large business going on in that day. And it seems that Philemon became a Christian. And there was actually a church maybe on his property. And what happened, there was a slave that escaped from, from Philemon. His name was Onesimus. And Onesimus escaped. He signed a contract, but he wanted to be free, so he escaped. Can't blame him for that, right? But he escaped, and he, where did he go and hide? He went to Rome. And guess who he ran into in Rome? The Apostle Paul. I don't know how he did. I don't know if they were letting people come into the prison where Paul was and hear him teach. Somehow he heard the teaching, and somehow he saw this man in chains that was talking about how you can be free in Jesus Christ. And it was an amazing thing. And Onesimus came to Christ. He became a believer. And Paul told Onesimus, you need to go back to Philemon. And you need to fulfill and obey that contract. But the amazing thing about it was, he wrote Philemon and he says, he said, Paul says this, when Onesimus gets there, you do not treat him as a slave. You treat 
him as a brother. And Paul says, if he, has any, if he owes you anything, whatever he owes you, I will pay for it. I love that. And we don't get the full story, but it's almost like the prodigal son. Here's, here's Philemon, a slave owner, and here comes Onesimus. And he embraces him, embraces him, because they're now believers in Jesus Christ. And now he lives out his contract, and he serves Philemon as his brother. And Philemon treats Onesimus. You see, God deals with the heart. That's why he just doesn't come out and yell at slavery. It, 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 he deals with the human heart, and that's, that's the answer. That's the way. Fighting and protesting all of it does not work. You've got to change the heart. John Newton, you, you, you know, I love John Newton. I talk about him a lot. You've got you to read his story. If you haven't read his story, Google it or, or get a book on John Newton who wrote the song Amazing Grace. And John Newton was, man, he was wild and crazy, and he was a slave trader, doing the bad kind of slave trading. And I want to tell you something. If you would have went to John Newton in his heyday, and you would have held up a picket sign and called him a racist, John Newton would have harpooned you to the wall. But John Newton, that proud, arrogant slave trader, picked up a Bible, and it broke his heart. It melted his heart, and he became a changed man. And you know the story. John Newton, at the end of his life, worked with Wilbur, William Wilberforce to abolish slavery. What happened? God changed his heart. God changed his heart. And that's why we as a church, we focus on the gospel. We focus on changing your heart and that will change the outside. And, and in this world, there's always going to be racism. There's always going to be, you know, we, we live in a modern, in our modern world of technology, and there's more human trafficking going on than ever before. We live in a barbaric world, and, and we hide under this sophistication. Why does that all go on? Because the Bible is true. And the human heart is depraved. And the only way to change this type of stuff, you got to change people's hearts. And until then, it's all going to continue to go on. And eventually, it's going to escalate to the point where Christ is going to return. Well, there'll be no more evil and sin. But only Jesus, Jesus is the answer now to change the heart. Jesus is the answer at your workplace to change your heart and the way you go about it. And Jesus is the only answer for this world. Not men coming together in this false unity, this fake hypocrisy unity that everybody talks about. That is not going to change the world. It's only, it's only getting more evil and man-centered and selfish. So I just wanted to address that area of slavery. Secondly, let's look at sincerity. When you're at your work, God wants you to be sincere in the way you work. Watch what he says in the last part of verse 22. He says, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart Fearing the Lord. The idea, sincerity of heart, you do it from your soul. You go to work, and from your soul, you are serving God because you fear God. You're not trying to please people. You, you as a believer, you're not supposed to be in it for the money or in it for the raise. You're not supposed to be working when, that, when the boss comes, in, comes to the, man, I, I work construction, and, and the boss would come to the job, and man, we were digging fast, digging fast, digging fast. That boss left, man, and we just slow, took a break, slowed down, put on his tool belt and mocked him and, bought, and pretended to be the boss, you know, but that's, that's, 
not what Christians are supposed to do. Christians are to be sincere. Christians are to serve at the job with sincerity of the heart because you fear God, because God is watching you. Every little thing you do. And I know some of you say, you have no idea, Pastor Frank, how crazy my boss is. But see, that's just it. You're not working for him. You're not working for her. You, you are working for God. Okay? You say, and I know this is what people do. They'll say to me stuff like, well, I know. You know God has told me I should not submit to this person because he's wrong. I should not submit. And, well, let, let, let's see if there's a Bible verse on that. If your boss is bad, should you submit to him? 1 Peter 2.18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but to the unjust. There it is. You serve your boss even if he's unjust. Of course, of course. If, if you're in a situation where you're being sexually harassed or abused or physically abused, listen, you need to get out of there. If, if your boss is, is uh, commanding you to do things against the law, you need to get out of there. And you need to lose that job for the glory of God. And if you're too weak, listen, if you're too weak, you're in a situation, you don't know how to confront whatever's going on, you're afraid to go to the proper authorities, come to the church, we will help you. And if we have to confront that boss, we will. And, and, if, and if, if he won't listen, then we'll, we'll go to the proper authorities and we'll, we'll, we want to help you. So, so when, whenever we use this word submission, submission, we must obey God rather than men. But just because your boss is a little harsh, just because he's talking to you and he doesn't respect you, and just because he's mean or, just, just, or maybe, maybe he's making you work more hours than you're supposed to and you're not being paired fairly, fairly. God says you go there and you work for God, not for that boss. And God will take care of you. God will bless you. Thirdly, notice, I call this sanctity. Notice the sanctity. Sanctity is a word that means holiness. It means set apart. So watch what he says here. These, these verses are great. Verse 23 says, whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. There it is. You go to your job tomorrow and you start working for God. You find joy in that. Know that God is going to take care of you. He's going to provide you. No longer are you going there to work for money. You're going to go there and work for God. God is sovereign. God has you in the situation you're in. So he says, whatever you do, whatever you do. Now, this could be, because I know there's always somebody, maybe you're, you don't have a job. You could be a stay-at-home mom. Trust me, that's, <laughs> that's harder than any job to stay at home and take care of kids. Sometimes it's just hard staying at home by yourself, taking care of the house, even with kids not there. Maybe you're on disability. You're not able to work. What do you do with that? You know, I know my brother Mark, my brother Mark, who loves serving God, he's just, he's, he's very sick. He's, diabetes has taken its toll on his life. And now with COVID, he basically has to stay at home and hide. And right before that, we started that Awana program. Man, it was booming. And Mark came over and was serving in the Awana. Man, he had so much joy. My grandkids love my brother Mark. He's got a great sense of humor. He's like a cartoon character. And they, they love him. But what does Mark do now? I, I guarantee you, some of you is like, I wish I could stay at home. 
I promise you, Mark's like, man, I wish I could get out. I wish I could come out and serve and work. Because we were, we were created to work. We were created to serve. And maybe some of you have found that out with COVID and you weren't at home and you just sit at home. It's driving people crazy. Because that's not what we were created to do. But what, to make a long story short, what I'm saying is Mark has to find a way to glorify God where God has him. He has to serve God where he's at. He has to pray where he's at. He has to do the little bit where he's at, knowing that's where God has him. Because if he looks at the situation, he's going to be frustrated. You the same. Whatever situation you're in, whatever is frustrating you, you're going to have to realize God has you where he has you. And you've got to quit looking at those circumstances and look to God and somehow find a way to have joy in your heart serving him. So whatever we do, we work for the Lord not for men. And it says we're going to receive an inheritance. Would you, what would you rather have? Would you rather have your boss reward you or would you rather have God reward you? Now, I know everybody in church and your answer is going to be God. But a lot of us, a lot of us, we're earthly minded. We'd rather give me the money now. I'll deal with those rewards in heaven when I get there. Yeah. And you have, you have no idea. You have no idea what's coming. And you have no idea of rewards in heaven. And oh, how you're going to wish that you were not earthly minded. And you put your mind on heaven. And when you stand before Jesus Christ and he, he rewards you. And the Bible says we're going to give all those rewards back to him. Man, I want to have some rewards to give back to him. And I'm just telling you, God is going to reward you. You're serving the Lord Christ. See, we have this idea that there are secular jobs and then there are sacred jobs. There's many of you, you, you really think you'd really like to be in the ministry. You'd really like to be in the full-time ministry because you, you see ministry as sacred. So like a pastor like me, everything I do, I do for God. But to God, there's no such thing. Every Christian's work is sacred. And so tomorrow when you go to work and you have no idea what they're even doing this for at work, what the purpose of it is, you, God is right there with you. And you are serving God. You are in the ministry. Just, just your work ethic, just, just your heart, just your heart, the aroma of your heart going up to God. And I don't care if it's pounding nails, carrying bricks, or digging with the shovel like I, I did. And I'll tell you what, and I, and I worked for a boss. He was a little guy, but he was, he was, uh, he was a little guy kind of like Napoleon was. And that same demon that was in Napoleon was in him. And, man, it was so hard to go and work for that guy. But the guys, the guys discipling me at 20 years old, they showed me these verses, and it changed my whole attitude. I totally went to work and worked for God and just ignored the guy screaming at me. And I had joy, and I had a smile on my face. So I'm telling you, it'll change your life if you go to work tomorrow and know that you are working for God. Well, secondly and finally, let's look at the heavenly-minded employer. Now, I'll break this down in two sections. Let's talk about judgment, and then we'll talk about justice. Paul talks a lot more to the employee than he does the employer. Because most likely, there were many, many slaves in the early church. And so he dealt with them first on, on how to go and have joy and to serve God. But he does, he does address the Christians who happen to be masters, slave owners, 
bosses, employers. And first, I want you to look at this word that I've called judgment. Colossians 3.25 says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Now, I could have put that verse with the employees because I think God is saying, listen, serve God, work for God, because listen, your boss is not going to get away with the abuse that he's heaping on you. But I also think this verse could be addressed to the employer or to the boss saying, listen, you're going to stand before God the way you treat those employees. And so it applies to, to both. Um, you know, I said it earlier, and I, I want to say it again. Nobody, nobody on this planet, nobody in the history of this world is getting away with anything. Now, we... Some of you, you live in frustration. You live in frustration of all the stuff going on in the world. The political hypocrisy, the sin, the abuse. And, and you see people with, they've got all the money in the world. And they just control part of their world. And people are neglected. And there's human trafficking. And man, it's just... It, it, it's never ending of all the evil that's being done in this world. And I'm telling you, as a young man, I, I lived in the frustration of it too. But I'm going to tell you something. God set me free from it. You know how he set me free? Because number one, I realized God's sovereign. And God is in control of every little thing that happens. And God allows evil for his purposes. Number one, that set me free from being so frustrated. This is God's deal. My job is to trust him. But also, you know what set me free? Nobody's getting away with anything. And they're all going to stand before God and give an account, Jesus said, for every careless word they have said. Everybody's given an account. Good, good news for us Christians, we're going to a different judgment. And we're, we're, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So, yeah, we're going to a rewards banquet. And what I'm trying to tell you is when you get to that banquet, you're going you're gonna to sure wish you served God more. But there's other people. They're going to the great white throne judgment where they will be sentenced forever and ever away from God. So I'm telling you, if you... Don't, so don't live in frustration. No, God is sovereign. No, nobody's getting away with anything. And focus on yourself. Focus on yourself. Get yourself right. God will take care of the rest. Get your heart right. Love the people around you. Do the work God has called you to do. One day at a time, Jesus said. And God will take care of the rest. And then finally, I call this justice. Justice. Colossians 4 1. It says, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So Paul is saying to these slave owners, these bosses, these masters, they called them, listen, you serve a master in heaven, you have a Lord that you serve as a Christian. And the point is, be like him. What kind of master is God to us? What kind of Lord is God to us? He's gracious, he's kind, he's merciful. He takes care of us. One day, and I know some of you, some of you can't wait to get to heaven because there's not going to be any work. Well, I got news for you. We're going to be working in heaven. We're just going to enjoy it. We're going to enjoy it because we have the ultimate Lord, the ultimate king, the ultimate master that loves us. 
And there are scriptures that even says Jesus is going to serve us in heaven. Think about that. The one we worship will serve with us together. And that day's coming. That day's coming sooner than we think. If you're a boss in here, if you own a company, be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. And I want to ask you a question. Do not answer out loud. I'm not that kind of pastor. Do not answer out loud. Okay? And this is not meant to be a joke. I'm going, you think I'm joking. I'm serious. If you're a boss in here, when your workers see you, boss, do they see a jerk or do they see Jesus? That's an important question for every Christian. And I'm telling you, if you're a boss in here, you need to be fair with your workers. I'm telling you, if you own a company and you owe somebody money, you need to pay the money. And you, you might say, well, Frank, these people are wrong. So what? For the glory of God and the sake of your Christian testimony, pay the debt and treat those employees right because God is watching and you will stand before him one day. Your Christian testimony is worth so much more than money. Close with a verse and a story and we'll be done. Micah 6, 8. Love this verse. Everybody needs to memorize this verse. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, be fair, and to love kindness, be kind, and to walk humbly before your God. If you're a Christian boss, you need to be humble. You need to be kind, and you need to be just and fair. And Jesus said, if somebody forces you to go one mile, you go two miles. And that that applies to the employee and the employer. Uh, Growing up, I've always loved the story around Christmas time, a Christmas carol, right? Charles Dickens, I've seen all of them. I've seen Scrooge in black and white. I've seen Scrooge in cartoons as Mr. Magoo. I've seen Bill Murray as Scrooge. I've seen Jim Carrey as Scrooge in 3D, okay? I've seen them all. And I love the Christmas Carol story and the message of it. And you all know Scrooge is evil. He's mean. He's an evil boss. He don't know about these verses, okay? And he is mean and cruel. And he gets visited by three ghosts that change him around, right? But what stands out to me in that story is the guy that works for Scrooge named Bob Cratchit. Bob Cratchit, you know, has that little boy, Tiny Tim, that's crippled. And it's, it's so touching. When the first ghost takes Scrooge to Bob Cratchit's house and all the other people, Bob Cratchit's wife and some of the friends they have over, they're all talking bad about Scrooge. But Bob Cratchit respects Scrooge. Bob Cratchit says good things about Scrooge. Bob Cratchit is acting like he's thankful for Scrooge and the job that he has. Amazing. That first, you think it's the last ghost that shows Scrooge his death that really sets him straight? Hey, that Bob Cratchit thing got to him. Now, who? Who, who in this world would respect and forgive and serve and work with all of their heart for a guy like, like Ebenezer Scrooge, somebody in a make-believe story, it's make-believe, you know. Or, talking about ghosts, somebody that has the Holy Ghost in them. And that's the only way. 
And so if you have the Holy Spirit and you're a Christian, you need to go work for Scrooge. And, and, and maybe, and maybe God will open his eyes with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and he'll see your work ethic, and he'll see your respect, and it might bring that Scrooge down that he might become a believer. You realize everything we do is about evangelism, don't you? Everything we do, especially at your work. May the Holy Spirit speak to all of you wherever you're at, I said last week, we come to the cross, we ask God to forgive us for the ways we have sinned, the way at our job we have sinned in whatever way, and then we let the Holy Spirit change us on the inside. Let's pray together since we're all getting phone calls. Let's pray together. Let's pray and close this up, and that's okay. That's okay. We love you. Forgiveness. Don't quit. <laughs> oh, boy. It's been a morning. It's been a morning. And God is so good. Praise his name. Let's, let's pray. As you bow your head and you close your eyes, as we conclude this uh, series on being heavenly minded, the heavenly minded family, uh, I want you to know there's no way you can do any of it unless you're a Christian. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Your, your eyes won't be open to it, and you won't be there unless Christ comes in. So if, you've, if you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, there's nothing you can do but fall on his mercy. And just like you're sitting in that chair, trusting that chair to hold you up, you sit there and you trust that God loves you and that God sent his son to die for you. And if you put your faith in that, you will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. And God will put his spirit in you and you will think different. You will talk different. And God can reverse the curse in every area of your life through the power of Jesus Christ and his spirit and his supernatural word. Get it into your mind. Get it into your heart. Father, we thank you for the book of Colossians. It is so powerful. We thank you for the way it's spoken to us and about changes we need to make and repentance that needs to take place in our life as we turn away from trusting ourselves and our own selfishness and we learn to trust in you. Oh God, help us to be heavenly minded. Help us to focus on the things above, God. Help us to do your will. Let that be our greatest desire. Change people. Let people go to work tomorrow rejuvenated with joy serving you. God, I pray you do something special in their life. I pray that this week as they go and serve you, that God, they would see the difference. And you would, and I know you'll reward them in the next life. I pray you reward them in this life. And let them see how real you are, God, and how you're with them in all things. God, help us as a church to love people. God, help us not to be so frustrated with all the evil in the world that we forget we're here to snatch people from the evil, to save them, to give them the gospel. Help us to be gospel-oriented. And may your name be praised. Now, God, as we sing, I pray, God, we would worship from our heart. And we pray all these things because of you, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship.